I'm going to thread my parents' story through the events surrounding the Sugihara visas. I'll cut through the fog of errors and myths and outright lies that have clouded this story in the years since it first became known. These are the people who told me the stories that I'm about to share with you. I'd like you to be able to picture them as I knew them, perhaps see these events through their eyes. Here they are more than 30 years after these events. They're pillars of the Orthodox community in Boston. My mother at this point is a third grade subject teacher at Maimonides School, a woman of high energy, high standards, adored by her students, a leader in every important organization in the Orthodox community and she's 23 years short of retiring at age 80 and until her death at 96 she was regularly invited to uh, give lectures about her extraordinary life and her education in Krakow. At the time of this photo my father is has been principal of Maimonides School for 25 years. He's a hard driving man with a commanding presence and he's five years from retiring and then retirement careers as a state prison chaplain and a kosher investigator for the Orthodox Union. And I might say as my parents got older, they, their statuses became ever more legendary. On the eve of World War II, they hadn't met. They're 60 miles apart, about 100 miles south of, of Vilna. They're both devout, both products of the finest Jewish educations in the Western world. And as I see it, they've been preparing for, for themselves for what lay ahead for their entire lives. My mother in 33 had gone to Krakow to the Beis Yaakov Seminary for Women, a revolutionary school for training teachers, which transformed what it meant to be an Orthodox woman. And she's now back in her hometown teaching at the local branch Beis Yaakov School. In 1933, my father had been beaten by brown shirts in a hall at the University of Hamburg. He had fled to study at the Mir Yeshiva, arguably the elite yeshiva of the Western Orthodox world, famous as a center for Musar, a system of ethics based on values and intense spiritual practices. He was already ordained and he was engaged in what we would call graduate studies. His father in Hamburg had a leather goods business selling harnesses and bridles to farm and such to the farmers, traveling through the countryside every week by horse and buggy, coming home for Shabbos exhausted, but according to my aunt, always sweet tempered. Here he is waiting to marry my grandmother. Here, he, here they are in front of his six siblings and their uh, spouses, the very image of a proper German bourgeois family of prosperous businessmen. There were six uh, children in my father's family. Uh, by 1925, no more horse and buggy. My grandfather's got an Opel. He now owns a warehouse in the Port District of Hamburg and a fine home in the best Jewish neighborhood. And he has only five years to live. And when he dies in 1931, after a year long illness, he left the family in dire straits. And my grandmother, with her head held high, sold cigarettes and chocolates door to door to survive for a while. She had indomitable will and uh, uh, I think gold in my ear. She just did not succumb to poverty. She never wavered. And she ultimately managed to find overseas refuge for all of her children. Oh, just quickly, this is what she looked like after the war. The, uh, my father had a superb college level education at Hamburg's famous Talmud Torah uh, Real Shula. It was the model for the modern Orthodox Hebrew day school, the model that my father used to build up Maimonides in Boston. And this picture is of interest because when the city of Hamburg decided to make amends for Kristallnacht, they, uh, they tried to restore this building and they found in the files this photograph, which they put on display. And uh, my father, my brother, and then my father stumbled across it 50 years later. It's a, it's a treasure to us. And anyway, in 33, after my, after he was beaten by brown shirts and my father goes to the Mir Yeshiva, despite the financial hardships and against the outraged opposition from the whole family. But my grandmother supported him and from my cousin Martin's memoir, he went to Mir against the family's better judgment at reversing the process of westernization of generations of Jews deliberately fleeing from Western European emancipation back into the Middle Ages. We all thought he should pursue a trade or study for a practical education, but he had the call and there was nothing to be done but let him pursue it. 
he and my father no more than 20 in the early days of Mir, a couple of incidents that suggest that he was going to play a big role later on. When the son of the local nobleman, a branch of the Radziwell family, attacked the Jew, my father struck him, a provocative and terrifying act in the eyes of his Eastern European uh, companions. They, they thought he was going to trigger a pogrom. In 38, the Germans pushed 17,000 Polish Jews over the border overnight, and the Polish prime minister announced he was going to retaliate. He was going to push German Jews back over the border into, uh, I mean, sorry, yeah, into Germany. And uh, my father was chosen to go to uh, Warsaw to meet with the leading Jewish member of parliament and to go to the prime minister to appeal. And, and that appeal was successful, though my father's always careful to point out he never got to say a word. The uh, parliamentarian did all the talking. At Mir, my father was so intense in his studies, so deeply devoted to Rabbi Yeruchim that uh, in the study of Musar, that he became forever known as one of Reb Yeruchim's Kosakim, one of his Cossacks, which I always understood to mean intensely committed, fiercely loyal. Uh, re recently, I've been wondering if that also doesn't have a little bit of a flavor of an enforcer. But in any case, Mir was a 19th century village, electrified. It's got a town pump instead of running water, maybe 400 Jewish homes in the village, many of them drawing income by providing either room or board to the students, very rarely both and the yeshiva has the only uh, uh, running toilets. Rav Finkel, the head of the school, is spoken only in the most glowing of terms other than by me. I have reservations, as you'll hear later. Uh, but uh, my father told me that, uh, my father never spoke an unkind word about Finkel, but he did tell me that before the war, Finkel chastised him for his activism and for his success in encouraging some of the best students to uh, emigrate before things uh, got really bad. And having seen the top rabbis, you're going to be surprised to see the yeshiva guys. They don't dress like that. They're dressed like proper young men, like, uh, like successful businessmen of the era. And my father, of course, with an ever-present cigarette in his hand, and that will be in his hand until literally days before the end. My grandmother, my mother comes a very different environment than a Hasidic family from a small town, Slonim. She's a profoundly devout woman, far less nuanced devotion than my work, my work, my more worldly German father. The when she spoke of these events, the hand of God and her resulting obligations were explicit. My father just never talked that way. My my grandmother gave birth to 14 children, five of whom died in childhood and one more drowned mysteriously at the age of 14, uh, possibly murdered. My grandfather was a scholar, a functionary of the Slonim of Rebbe, known to everybody. The economy was terrible, especially for Jews. And in 24, my mother was only eight. My grandfather went to America to maze, raise funds for the Slonim of Yeshiva. He dies there in 32 of flu. And my mother, my mother at that point is 16. He had become an American citizen and he decided against bringing the family to America because as he saw it, it was a trefer land, a non-kosher country, not a suitable place to raise a Jew. And like my other grandmother, this woman had indomitable spirit. She didn't succumb to poverty. She scrambled for a living while feeding a very large household. She ran a little shop with her oldest daughter, Fagel. She uh, ran a, a cafe and market day for the peasants. Uh, out of her home, she made ice cream and ran a bakery. My mother would talk about getting up before dawn and winter mornings, loading up the horse and wagon to deliver bread. An image to, to this day I can barely wrap my head around. So my grandmother, despite the poverty, uh, and got the got the blessing of the Slender Marebi, and they uh, set a shop set aside the shop's income for tuition and they sent my mother to follow her dream to go to take the 16-hour train ride to Krakow to the base Yaakov seminary. This is where the time when educated orthodox girls was often seen as heretical. The seminary was a two-year intensive teaching program both religious and secular secular uh, subjects designed to train teachers to build up and staff a network of branch schools for all across Poland. 
the graduates will be sent out to towns and villages, not to their hometowns, to start brand schools, to staff exist existing ones. The mission was to give young female students a good Jewish and secular education so that they could have the tools for successful lives, Torah true lives, to fend off the siren pull of modern life of civilization, and thus assure the future of Judaism. This was a cause. And by 1938, there were 250 branches of this school providing education to 38,000 females. And to this day, Beis Yaakov graduates are the, 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 uh, the elite of the devoutly orthodox. If you can marry your daughter to a Beis Yaakov girl, you have lifelong bragging rights. As long as you can put up with an intelligent, assertive daughter-in-law. If you want a doormat, you have to go somewhere else. By 19, my mother is uh, graduated. She's been sent to Rosanne to found a school. The, uh, she only stays there for a week. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for a year. She passes on the baton, goes to a bigger town, where now, among other things, she has uh, opportunities to socialize with peers, a few dollars. She can now begin to indulge her lifelong taste for fashion. For fashion. The, uh, uh, it looks a little like Ma Nancy Reagan does. The, uh, she's 22 now. She's living in Slunden with her mother and her, her sister and her nieces and nephews. This is the time of happiest time of her life. Here she is with her final fourth and fifth grades. Uh, uh, little does she know that her world is about to explode. September 1st, the Germans invade from the West and six years of murders and atrocities begin. And Jewish soldiers suffer the highest casualty rates, holding out while the rest flee, including the army leaders and the prime minister. On the 17th, the Russians invade from the east, and they are initially joyfully received by the Jews. And then in many towns, the Jewish militias have to come out and protect the Jews from rampaging Poles until the Red Army comes. Two to three hundred refugees flee into the Russian sector, and soon their initial welcome turns sour and they're ordered to become Russian citizens or else they're going to be deported to Siberia. And 40% of Siberia, uh, I'm sorry, and many are sent anyway to Siberia, no matter what they decide. And 40% of those die, but 95% of those that don't get to Siberia die. Now, Poland is at this point divided. The, 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 uh, the German and the Russian armies meet along this line. The uh, Germans are 100 miles from Slunder, where my mother is. Lithuania is a free country for the time being. Uh, Vilna is part of uh, Poland. And on October 15th, my father's buddy hears on his shortwave radio that Vilna is about to be handed over to, uh, to the Russians. Uh, no border, it, briefly, you won't have to cross a border to get to Vilna. And then the border is going to jump over and you'll be in free Lithuania, no longer under Russian control. The yeshiva boys waste no time. They pack up. My father buries his books. As I remember, he wrapped them in oil cloth and buried them in a case under the door sill of a barn in the crazy kill and the uh, hope they could one day return. They hightail it over the, over the border. The yeshiva leaderships are urged to move to Lithuania, expecting to survive the war there and the town rabbis are encouraged to stay with their people. Estimates vary, but about 2,500 yeshiva guys go an equal number of chalutzim, pioneers training for, to develop agriculture in Palestine, and 2,500 others scramble over the line into Vilna, and more will come later. It's from this pool of refugees that most of the people that will later be able to use Sugihara visas will be drawn, It'll be disproportionately the yeshiva people, and it will be disproportionately from them, the mere yeshiva people. And back in Russian-occupied Poland, life is becoming hell, Stalinist terror, arbitrary arrest. Every single communal religious organization is disbanded. Religious practice exposes you to the police. There are, as I mentioned, arbitrary arrests. Businessmen are enemies of the proletariat. People are being forced to inform on their friends, on their neighbors, even on their family members. My mother told me we were always afraid. And meanwhile, she switched to teaching the first grade because in the first grade, she said, we didn't have to teach the children that Stalin was God. That became later. 
that soon the Russians order that after New Year's, schools are switching to a six day week from a seven. In other words, my mother will have to work six out of every seven Shabbos and she cannot do that. She gets permission and blessing from her mother to go. And, uh, and the fear is so intense, she's afraid even to tell her younger brother. The border is by now closed. My mother takes two of her uh, base Yaakov teachers, her 15 year old nephew Shlomo, and they choose New Year's Eve because nobody's going to expect these pious people to be visible at New Year's Eve parties. And they're hoping the Russian border guards are going to be drunk. It's a record cold, record cold winter. They find a farmer to guide them on this dangerous journey on foot through the forest. They were caught by a Russian border guard. Fortunately, one of the girls had a gold coin and he accepted it to let them go. My mother always said it was 50 miles and I used to argue it could be 50 miles, it must have been 50 kilometers, 30 miles. But looking at the map, I have a terrible feeling. I owe my mother an apology. Meanwhile, life briefly for the refugees is good in Vilna. My mother is proud that she's uh, making a living. She's making ends meet, she's teaching, she's uh, uh, knitting the, uh, and uh, everything is good. And she meets my father at a wedding in Vilna. And at some point he tells her he's going to find a way to America. She, he'll take her with him. She can uh, be his wife in name only, no obligations. In later years, he told me that he saw her across the room at, at a wedding and it was love at first sight. And my mother giggled as she said he was just a ticket out of Europe. And seeing my father here uh, without a shirt, without a beard, a young rabbi, and I know my Hasidic mother at that point in life, I, I can't imagine that a man dressed like this is who she envisioned as her husband. But in any case, they stay in touch. Now life is going to be take a turn even for the worst because everything is going to go bad in Lithuania. There are anti-Jewish riots, the currency is devalued, bread goes up fivefold, there are long lines, work restrictions. The yeshiva is dispersed to Kedanya, 80 miles away. My mother takes a job 40 miles further than that as a nanny to these little children. They didn't survive. Everybody is trapped. The refugees can't get entry papers. They have, many have no passports. Most have no money. And Russia is not giving uh, uh, visas to cross Russia, Russia. Many yeshiva heads are demanding that their students do nothing. Just wait out the war and then we'll go back. If some of you escape, the rest of us will be made to suffer. Some even want to go back to Poland right now. This is Zorach Verhaftik, a very important guy. He was the Jewish agency representative in, in Warsaw, Vasha. He organized emigration to Israel. He made a spectacular escape to, to Vilna. And now he's back trying to get people anywhere. You can't get to Palestine anymore. Anywhere you can get papers, there's hardly any. Jewish internet, international efforts are chaotic, disorganized. Organizations are fighting among themselves. A little money is coming from the Joint Distribution Committee in America, some from the Jewish agency. It takes a lot of organization just to get a few out, much less keeping people alive. And the American offices and Polish yeshivas are refusing to give money for emigration. They claim our, no, our job is to maintain the yeshivas, not to fund these guys to go touring around the world. A triumph of bureaucratic interest over decency. So the Vat Hatzala, the Orthodox Yeshu, uh, Union, organizes the Vat Hatzala Rescue Committee to focus specifically on rescuing Jewish scholars. Meanwhile, at Mir, a strong Jew group of activists, and guess who's in the middle, of course, uh, uh, wants to go to America, and Rav Finkel wants the boys to sit in Poland and wait while he goes to Palestine and makes arrangements to break, uh, make the, bring them over. Not very practical. They can't confront him directly, so they go to Varhaftik to stage an intervention. He bursts into Finkel's lecture hall, sh shouting, "Why are you waiting here to be killed?" Finkel is shocked into listening, and he agrees to let the Polish students get the. Uh, at least get passports because if they ever do get visas anywhere, they're going to need passports. And the, the British embassy, the Free Poland legation at the British embassy is giving out passports freely, uh, but they will in, quickly be invalidated. 
And meanwhile, word comes from America that the yeshiva guys who managed to escape should marry Beis Yaakov teachers to save them. But unfortunately, very few do. In May, things begin to break. At this lowest point, a crack in the prison walls would begin to appear. First of all, LPJ Dodeca, the Dutch ambassador in Riga, he fires the, the, uh, the uh, Dutch consul in Kovna, who was a Nazi sympathizer. And he appoints this guy, the Phillips radio representative, not a diplomat, as, it is, as, as a replacement. And uh, he's known as Mr. Phillips Radio because years later, when they were looking to who was this guy, uh, nobody can remember his name. And many thought his real name was Phillips Radio. And I suppose if you've got what a, a distinctly uh, foreign Polish name, Phillips Radio could be a Dutch name. The, uh, but in any case, by mid-May, the Russians begin to assume control. Now it's just like back in Poland. They Sovietize. Yeshiva leaders are in hiding. The refugees are in despair. And from this point on, I have to tell you, every single fact that I tell you is going to be contradicted by many of the books and articles and magazine, uh, new moves, movies, video uh, uh, interviews that are out there. They all contradict each other. The, if I, I could, I'm prepared, by the way, where it where does it come up. I can defend every single conclusion I came to. I've cross-referenced, I've studied, and uh, I, I've been very conservative in what I believe and what I didn't. So, how did this happen? Who was on first? Pesla Levin, a Dutch, a formerly a Dutch citizen, she marries this Polish rabbi and moved to Poland to, to live with him in Łódź. And uh, they're now among the refugees in Lithuania. By, by marrying him, she's lost her Dutch citizenship. And uh, she, she goes to Schwarzendijk. Can he issue her a visa? because she used to be a Dutch citizen, to Dutch East Indies, Java, Sumatra, what's now Indonesia. And he turns her down because she's not Dutch. She writes to LBJ, LBJ. he turns her down. She writes back again. You know, I was a Dutch citizen. Isn't there anything you can do to help me? And he writes back, he says, well, there's no visa needed for Dutch West Indies, Curaçao and Suriname, but you need the governor's permission. He doesn't really give it. And she writes back, can you just write that for me? Leave out the butt. He says, send me your passport. And she says, he signs it on July 11th. This, here you see it here. Un visa d'entrée n'est pas requis. This is the wedge that will widen the crack through which Sugihara can come to the rescue. Of course, this is going to be immediately, the visa, the passport is going to be invalidated. Four days later, her husband gets a leader mass, a safe conduct pass from the Lithuanians for the family. On the, seven days later, Pesla goes to Schwarzendijk, and he agrees to write the same message as LPJ on their passport. You see it here. And the, the next day, a couple of other guys, and Wahaftik finds out, spreads the word, and over the next nine days, Schwarzendijk signs 2,300 of these Curaçao uh, visas, notations, and 300 is she, uh, the, the yeshiva, Miri yeshiva guys, they bring 300 of their passports, uh, and the passports are signed, handwritten, typed, uh, uh, the last uh, thousand are stamped before the Russians order him to close the embassy, and he has to uh, return to Holland after being held by the Russians by, for a month. And here we have Mr. Sugihara, Shuine, also known as Sempo Sugihara. He's only been in Kaunas since October of 39, the first uh, a Japanese uh, diplomat, a mysterious guy. And maybe we can talk about him later in the, in the Q&A. On the 26th, uh, the Levins come with their, uh, with their uh, Kurosawa uh, signature, and they tell uh, Sugihara Visa that together with uh, Pestle's mother, who's Dutch, her brother is Dutch, and of course, uh, uh, Rabbi Levin, they, uh, and uh, Sugihara accepts their story, it's reasonable, and he signs visas 16, 17, and 18 for them. And the uh, uh, word spreads, a crowd of desperate people gather. Vahaftik jumps in in the middle of that, and uh, Sugihara asks for a delegation to come and explain to him what's happening. And they uh, tell him their story. He agrees to consider, he cables 
the foreign ministry of J in Japan for instructions. Supposedly three times. The first two times they tell them they have to have end visas, they have to have money, no exceptions. And meanwhile, he's signing a few of the more legitimate ones. And then the third cable, he doesn't get a response. And that seems to be his clue to just go to, go to town. The, uh, and, and I don't know if I mentioned again, the Mir Yeshiva guys, meanwhile, they've shown up with their same 300 passports with the Kurosawa notations. It's rare to find an article that says Sugihara threw caution to the wind before the 10th or the 15th of, uh, of August. But I've gone through the list. It's not true at all. Uh, the 29th, he did 120. The 30th, he did 269. By the 5th of October, he's up to 1,030. And 166 in a row are from the Mir Yeshiva. And the next day, even more and more. By the end of the month, he's uh, signed 2,139 visas. And he's forced to close the embassy and uh, go to the, uh, 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 Berlin and then Budapest, where he lives out the war. Uh, and then the Russians hold him for like 22 months before he's able to return to Japan in 47. And just quickly, this is the the uh, Gudza, the German assistant. Uh, he's supposedly proven to have been a Gestapo agent spying, spying on Sugihara. He's also, Sugihara, meanwhile, is reported to be in contact with the Polish underground. I can't find conf good confirmation either one, but I love the story nonetheless that Gudza asked by one of the Jews, why are you doing this for us? He says, the world is a wheel. Today, Hitler is on top. Tomorrow, he may be on the bottom. Don't forget what I did for you. And this is the uh, the stack of, uh, of uh, documents that Sugi Hara submitted, 2,900. 2,139 names. This is just a close-up of the first page. You see it's on the 9th of July is the first one. On the 26th, the 11th show up. And uh, well, you can't quite see it. The 27th then begins the bigger number. And this is Schwarzendijk's notations, 41 handwritten, 45 is typewritten. Later on, they're going to be stamped. This one happens to be Varhaftik's. And this visa only of sentimental value. This has to be one of the last ones because Sugihara supposedly left by the 28th. So this is probably a forgery, but this is of value to us. This family traveled to America with my parents and after their death, their grandson gave it to my father. And I understood that was a token of, of recognition of my father's role in, in getting them out. And just a quick review of the timeline. On the 19th, Schwarzenbach replaces the Nazi sympathizer. On the 11th, it's the first Kurosawa visa. On the 22nd, it's the, uh, it's the second. And uh, on the 26th, I'm sorry, is, is the replacement. On the 26th, uh, uh, the first uh, Sugihara signature. And then on the 28th, a miracle, the Russians agreed to issue transit papers transit visas, they haven't let anybody out of Russia since 1925. Now, this is my father's safe conduct pass. I only know how the mere handle things. There's a little bit of selling of possessions, but the money's mostly gonna come from the Vadhat Sala, a little bit from the joint. And my father gets the job of exchanging the money on the black market for the mere for dollars, because this, this uh, I'm, I think I must've skipped it. You have to be interviewed by the secret police get a, approval that's sometimes quick, that's sometimes slow. Then you go to interest, a travel agency, and you have to buy tickets in American dollars, nothing less. And the price has been jacked up tenfold since a month earlier. So, and my father goes to interest and absolute, there's no exceptions. There's gotta be uh, dollars. Go to the black market. If you get here with the dollars, um, God, I'm leaving us there. I, I may have left out that carrying dollars was illegal, possibly a death penalty, possibly Siberia, different versions. But uh, my father is told if you get to the office with the dollars, we won't arrest you. But if you're caught outside, nothing will help you. 
And my father has the chutzpah to go to the German consulate with his passport with the big red J on it and ask for protection as a German citizen in case the Russians put, uh, arrest him with dollars. And he's received beautifully by a, a, an official who apparently was not a Nazi, but from the Deutsche Nationale Volkspartei. And he gives my father advice such as, don't carry a passport when you're on a mission. He gives him a private number. Call me if you get caught with dollars. I'll get you out. My father never had opportunity, opportunity to test it, but he, was, he believed the man was true to his word. And he even asked the guy, so why are you helping me? You know what's going on in Germany. And the guy says, outside of Germany, I have an obligation to you as a German citizen. Inside of Germany, other rules apply. So my father would describe, I'm not sure the details here again, about taking guys to the NKVD or taking guys to interest, marching up to the front of the line. I don't know if he was, did this for everybody or just for certain people that needed this help. It was very unclear from the, uh, the several accounts that I have. But in any case, a yeshiva guy would get interviewed, uh, he would get the exit visa and then wait for a check from America to buy tickets because the checks couldn't go to the yeshiva because the Russians would confiscate it. My father would wash the money in the black market, give it to the guy or take the guy to, uh, to get the tickets. But uh, that wasn't fast enough because you couldn't wait so long to get your tickets after the, you got your visa. So the Russian yeshiva, the head of the school, fronted my father money. My father would then wash it, give it to the next guy in line. The guy would authorize my father to, to take his money, to receive his money when it came, and on it would go, washing and cycling the money. Uh, my father, uh, in an interview, I was advised not to carry my passport, yet I had it on my person the night I was arrested. We were sleeping some 20 people in a room. Red soldiers came in, shining their lights, asking to see our papers. And of all people, they arrested me. I had never found out why they singled me out. When I realized that the window of the room that I was in prison in was near the ground, I softly opened it, climbed out. I went to a shul. Shuls were open all that night those days. And I don't recall being scared. It was more like tension before, before a battle. The, uh, and in the morning, I got the bus back to where we were staying at Kedanya. And when I had future business in Kovna, I certainly didn't go back to that place. Before my arrest, I would sometimes have someone else hold my passport only when I was on the black market or when I was at interest. After that, I didn't keep my passport on me even at night. One of the other German boys would hold it for me. Now we come to the end of the year, and uh, my father sends my, the most of the guys have gone already. Uh, my father has, uh, sends my mother an urgent letter, come to Vilna, we're going. They marry in a civil ceremony on January 3rd, so she can travel in his papers. And as I said, this is not a halachic wedding. They do not live together as husband and wife. A month later, they get the, uh, the, the registration translated to English because my father, as I said, he's going to America. He's going to need this. And here they are just before they embark. And, and I just, I love this picture. I think my mother has the look of a woman that knows she's going to be saved. They already have heard back from Vladivostok that this is on the level. The Russian, this is not just a, a Russian scam to get you to Siberia and leave you there. And by, by the way, they have no idea at this point that the uh, the British ambassador has just written to the uh, uh, Japanese foreign ministry telling him not to let these Jews with the Sugihara visas in. They're fraudulent. fraudulent. And perhaps in reply, on December 31st, the Japanese foreign minister announces, I am the man responsible for the alliance with Hitler, but nowhere have I promised that we will carry out his anti-Semitic policies in Japan. This is not simply my personal opinion, it is the opinion of Japan, and I have no compunction in announcing it to the world. At the same time, the American ambassador cables Washington that there are thousands of Jews piling into Japan. They supposedly are going to Curacao, but they're not. They're all going to try to come to America. My parents, uh, they take the uh, overnight train 
to uh, Moscow from Vilna, then a 12 day trip to Vladivostok. In Vladivostok, the train is sealed for 24 hours. My father never knew why, but I found out when I did research. The Japanese had just sent back a ship, a load of 80, 88 Jews because their paperwork is no good. The Russians didn't want them back. They threatened to close the whole system down. The Japanese needed the sea route. The Japanese needed the sea route, so they backed down. They uh, they take the uh, this uh, I'm this. Uh, little ship, the Amakusa, the Amakusa Maru. I only have this position, picture here. I just wanted to give a shout out to this guy from the Japanese tour, tourist board. He was so wonderful. He wrote mu musingly and poetically about these Jewish refugees, about the sad eyes, uh, the loneliness of people in exile. exile. But I, I just love this line of his, how he saw women of rarely seen beauty. So in Kobe, they're welcomed by the Jukwam, that is the cable address of the Jewish community, uh, and maybe 25 families, maybe a few more. Magnificent. They provide aid, shelter, guarantees. To, uh, they interfere with government officials when needed. They send money to those Jews that might still be stuck in, in uh, Vladivostok. And when they're overwhelmed by the cost, 28 cents a day, up to 1,000 refugees at a time, they get back a cable, money, no object, save Jews. And my mother, by the way, in Kova, uh, my brother later asked him, did you see the beautiful sights? And she says, being a refugee is a full-time job. The, uh, the Japanese people are curious, they're friendly, uh, no anti-Semitism. People were interested in the exotic yeshiva boys, open expressions of sympathy. They even help them in Port Matza. They give them a building to study in. The, uh, and meanwhile, uh, uh, and the, in February, just before my parents come, military leaders in, in Tokyo, they summon the leadership, want to know what's going on in particular. Why do the Germans hate you so much? This man here, by the way, is a secretary to the uh, foreign minister. He became a Jew after the war. His 1937 visa was the development of the alphabet of the Semites. And then he wrote a manual of uh, Jewish uh, grammar and Hebrew. And he converts to Judaism after the war. And Wahaftik was the Sandak, the man that held him for the circumcision. But in any case, the, the military leaders asked, why are you hated so much? And the classic answer from the Amshanova, because we are Asians and you are also on the list. Young man, read what they say in Europe, not the sense of translation you're getting here. They talk about the Aryan race, six feet tall, blonde, blue eyes, Caucasian. They talk about the Jews, the uh, gypsies, the Slavs, the blacks, the yellows. You are the yellows. And when they're finished with us, they're coming for you. There's no specific, uh, no record of the specific response, except they're told to go back to Cobra and not worry. Meanwhile, my father is hustling to get a, a visa. The American consul in Cobra, completely uncooperative, anti-immigrant, but the consul in Yokohama agrees to give my father a visa if he can get an affidavit of guarantee that he won't become a, a public ward. My father writes to his cousin Martin, the one I quoted from earlier, gets that guarantee that doesn't mention my mother. My father writes her name in and the consul accepts it. They get their visas on the 28th of uh, May, never knowing that on the 5th, the consulates were ordered to turn away refugees who had relatives living in under German or Russian control, which both of them did. Another narrow escape. They left Japan on the 14th on this, uh, on this uh, luxury liner with 800 passengers. Uh, it landed and uh, it pulled into San Francisco Harbor on the 27th. And uh, the, uh, at the same day that the Germans reached Mir and celebrated by murdering 1,500 Jews. And the disembarkation is on Shabbos the next day. And uh, my father, of course, refuses to get back, even though he's threatened, uh, we're not going to help you. You're going to be stuck in a foreign country. But uh, he waits until after dark. Of course, and uh, all through my childhood, my mother would always repeat this name because she has the idea that in America, if the authorities stop you and you couldn't tell them the name of the, of the ship that you came on, they would ship you back. They take the train to New York where my mother is going to stay with her brother. My father takes the train to uh, 
to uh, Boston and, and uh, comes back on Saturday nights to court my mother. They get married on November 7th. Here they are, beginning of 42. I believe that my mother is pregnant and I just love my father's hat in the picture, the tree, that is so much my father. And of course, in my humble opinion, what makes it worthwhile is here I am born a year later, named after my grandfather. And we open the floor. <laughs> 